Good morning. So uh, I'm reading from Numbers chapter 21, and the, uh, the Israelites have had an amazing victory over uh, the Canaanites. So here they are heading off now to the Red Sea. Then the people of Israel set out for Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There's nothing to eat here, nothing to drink. We hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. That's the reading of God's word. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Jan. So we're in John chapter 3 today. We're starting at verse 1, and that passage might have seemed a strange passage to read, but as the snake was lifted up in the wilderness and people had faith and looked upon it, they would be healed. So the Son of Man was lifted up, Jesus, so that if you looked upon him, you'd be spiritually healed. And that comes in our passage today. I also want to make note that I don't have my shoes on. So, um, you know, people sometimes like, hey, pastor, do you realize you didn't have your shoes on? No, I, I didn't. No, I, I have, a, I have a, a, a blister on my toe and I walk with a limp right now if I put shoes on. It's, so it's, that's why I'm in my bare feet. So don't send me a text later. Did you know you didn't have your shoes on? I am aware that my shoes are not on. So I just thought I'd make mention. Uh, welcome, it's good to see all of you, and if you're watching online, it's good to see you as well. I'm going to pray for us, and we will get into the message, which I'm excited about. Father, thank you very much for everybody who's here. For those children who went downstairs, Father, they are precious in our sight. They're precious in your sight. And Father, I pray that every one of them would be put, found putting their trust and their faith, growing in you and knowing you all the days of their lives. And Father, I, I prayed for the teachers, that you'd encourage them and um, help them, give them energy and strength and encouragement as they teach our children. Such an important role. And Father, for us, uh, if everything that's in our culture right now, with everything that's going on, with all the pressure that is there, um, the control that is there, uh, everything that is, is just pressing against us in this culture, I pray that we'd be found trusting your word, going to your word, seeking truth, seeking you, trusting in you every step of the way, because it is so important today to keep our focus. So help us to keep that focus and to serve you in a way that you truly deserve in spirit and truth and to worship you in spirit and truth. And may we do that today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever had an encounter with someone that radically changed your life? Have you ever had an encounter with someone that eventually was going to change your life in a significant way? When I was in college, I met, met a man at the University of Northern Colorado who would permanently change the direction of my life. Now, I didn't think much of it when I ran into John Mark Purdue at the University Center. Many people had tables at the University Center promoting their groups and activities as a new year was starting, and it was kind of jammed with people that were promoting one thing or another, and he was promoting a campus ministry. He invited me to his campus ministry. I had a good conversation with him. I said I would go, but I did not for over a year. Yet the encounter impressed me. I could tell that he was sincere. I enjoyed the conversation. I thought I could really benefit from this individual. And I'd see him from time to time on campus, and he'd invite me to come again and again. And every time, something touched me inside saying, pay attention, pay attention. Well, it did leave an impression that later bore fruit. As I got involved in ministry, was discipled by him, and he did change my life, completely altered my life. It's probably... One specific reason why I'm up here today and standing before you today was that interaction that was life-altering. Well, in our passage today, we see someone have a life-altering encounter, one that really we all need to have. 
And I would invite you to turn with me to John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now, this initial interaction between Nicodemus and Jesus and Nicodemus' later response reveals that Nicodemus was sincerely seeking truth. His encounter with Jesus made an impact. As a matter of fact, we see that later in the book of John. In John chapter 7, verse 50 to 51, Nicodemus is defending Jesus in discussion before the Jewish leaders, which would have taken a lot of guts to do so. It says, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, the passage we'll be looking at today in John 3, and who was one of their own number, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? So he's coming to Jesus' aid and defense because that first initial impression had, had, had such an impact upon him. And then later in John 19, verse 38 to 40, after Jesus dies on the cross, it says later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. And so this impression had stuck with Nicodemus through his life. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, which I understand would be very expensive. Taking the body, the two of them wrapped it with its spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. Now, non-biblical sources tell us Nicodemus was baptized and suffered as a follower of Jesus. Today, we see the initial encounter that was to change his life forever, and I mean forever, for an eternity. Now, there's two main points that we're looking at today. First, we're looking at the reason for the encounter, and then we're looking at the result of the encounter. The reason for the encounter, the result of the encounter. It was important to Nicodemus, and it's important to us as well. So the reason for the encounter was to seek truth. He goes to Jesus seeking truth. Well, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and so he's going to a very good, reputable source in order to find truth. In John chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, it says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So who is Nicodemus? Well, he's a Pharisee. It's one thing it tells us. And not only was he a Pharisee, he was a member of the Jewish ruling class, or the Sanhedrin. And this was a group of 70 elite persons, and minus the high priest, that consisted of priests and scribes and leaders from influential families that were controlled by Rome. And really, it's not, in, it's not something you're going to find the Sanhedrin in Scripture, as far as something God did like in the Old Testament said, you shall have a Sanhedrin. This is a Roman group that they put together really in order to control the Jews. Uh, and so this, this group had power. They were the ruling court in both civil and religious matters. So Nicodemus was a part of that group, the same group that ultimately would be getting people to yell crucify at Jesus' crucifixion. Nicodemus was also a sincere seeker. He approached Jesus at night, probably because he is a fear of the disapproval of the rest of his group. But it's interesting that he came to him at night. It, it, it shows a sincerity. Sometimes people came to Jesus and said things that Nicodemus is going to say that like butter him up or try to trap him in some way. But in this case, it's very sincere. Uh, he's coming to Jesus at night. He's seeking truth. He wants to know who Jesus is. He wants to discover who Jesus is. He's seen the things that he's doing, and it has left an impression upon him. But he feared the other Jewish leaders, just as Joseph of Arimathea had done. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 19, verse 38 again, it says, Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. Well, Nicodemus is interested. He's seeking truth. He's searching. He wants to know more about Jesus, but he's got to worry about his cohorts, the other 69 in that group. Now, Nicodemus' tone throughout this, his conversation with Jesus was respectful. He called Jesus rabbi and a teacher who has come from God, which is really high praise from somebody in the Sanhedrin. And Nicodemus was also a critical thinker. He was looking at what's taking place. He's looking at the miracles and the things that Jesus is doing, and he's taking note of that. He observed that Jesus could not do the miracles he was doing without God being with him. Uh, and and he, he mentions that in our passage, and it's something that he noticed that other people, for some reason, should have taken note of, but were not noting. Matter of fact, Jesus called them out on this at one point. In John chapter 10, verse 37 to 38, Jesus told religious leaders, Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works 
that you may know and understand the Father is in me and I in the Father. Well, Nicodemus was already at that point where he's looking at the works of Jesus. He's identifying this is a work of God. What he is doing is a work of God. The other religious leaders were not noting that, but Nicodemus was. Finally, Nicodemus was a sinner who needed a savior. Jesus' conversation was going to point not to Nicodemus' great credentials, but rather to his great need. But Nicodemus is seeking truth. He's seeking Jesus, and he realized God was with Jesus. He recognized the work of God when he saw it. And I think this is instructive to us today. Do we realize the work of God when we see it? Are we seeking truth? Are we God seekers? Do you notice the handiwork of God? Do you pay attention to what he is doing? God's work is seen in general revelation through creation and in special revelation through his word. In general revelation, as we look at his creation, his miracles really are everywhere. His fingerprints are pretty much on everything he has created. In Psalm 19.1, it even says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. So you look up at the universe, and you see the vast array of stars, and you see the beauty and the majesty, and you see that everything is fine-tuned when you look at that, and, and how just the, the specific design is so clear of intelligent design that is there. The heavens are declaring the glory of God, and people who are scientists can actually look up and see the handiwork of God in something that is orderly and not chaotic, something that is unusual, something that should catch their attention and they should take note of. And whether you look up or whether you look inward, like at the cell and the, the complexity of the cell and the intelligent design in the cell, the, the general revelation, this, this, the creation of God is proclaiming who he is. Are we paying attention to that? I mean, in the world, they tell you everything's like, what? It's like evolved, right? There's, there's this process. Things have always been here. No. What, what we know is that there was a time when everything was created. There was a time when, it, there was a time before this, you want to blow your mind? It always blows my mind. Can you think of a time before time existed? That's just one of those things that kind of, kind of get to me. But we know um, from science observation that time came to point. There, there was a time when everything was, was happened. Everything came to be. We call that creation. And he's saying, just open your eyes. Look at what I've created. The signature of the artist is on the artwork. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, it says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. It's not hidden. It's clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. It's really clear when you look at his creation that there is a creator. Ravi Zacharias, in his sermon, If the Foundations Be Destroyed, recalled the events of December 25th, 1968. He said, on Christmas Day, 1968, the three astronauts of Apollo 8 circled the dark side of the moon and headed for home. Suddenly, over the horizon of the blue rose the blue and white earth garlanded by the glistening light of the sun against the black void of space. Those sophisticated men, trained in science and technology, did not utter Einstein's name. They did not go, even go to the poets, the lyricists, or the dramatists. Only one thing could capture the awe-inspiring thrill of this magnificent observation. Billions heard the voice from outer space as the astronaut read it. In the beginning, God. The only concept worthy enough to describe that unspeakable awe, unutterable in any other way, in the beginning, God created. The invasive and inescapable, inescapable sense of the infinite and eternal. Well, Jesus' miracles went unrecognized by the ruling class, with the exception of Nicodemus. He noticed God's work when he saw it. He was able to look at it and identify it with the prophecies, the Old Testament, whatever is going in his head, but he was able to say, that is God's work. You couldn't be doing what you're doing unless God is with you. And he identified God's work for what it is. Do we? God also reveals himself through special revelation, through scripture that he's given to us. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The amount of manuscript evidence we have is very impressive. 
Uh, we have over 24,000 different manuscript evidences, and that's growing all the time. We have them in the Greek, we have them but in different languages, and they're all internally consistent. And what we see is even though it's 66 books written um, in three different continents and 40 different authors over 1,500 years, it's one mind. And, and we can look at literary criticism and see the internal evidence that suggests with very clearly that we can trust this as absolutely being the truth of God's word. We have archaeology that backs up the truth of God's word. We have prophecy that backs up the truth of God's word. We can know beyond any reasonable doubt that what we have in God's word is truth. So let's take note of that and realize what it is. And let's make sure we know it. You know, he's given us the special revelation of his word right here. You know, in, in 50 some countries, you can't even handle God's word. Um, it's not allowed in the country. Why do you think that is? There is a spiritual battle going in place where the enemy does not want you to know this. And what's really sad is we live in a culture where the word is so available. I mean, I have an online app that, you know, you can just, you can look at and there's 80 some different translations of versions right there. And it's so handy and we have all sorts of helps and everything else, yet most people don't read the word. They don't, we don't read the word of God. We tend not to. Well, we're busy. I mean, Apple Plus has got a new TV program that's going to take all this time of mine because I've got to binge walk, watch that, right? But I don't have time to look at God's word. And we just started a reading where if you, you can read through God's word, if you look at this 15 minutes a day on the average, it's what it takes to get through his word in a year. And some people say, I don't have time for that. I'm not going to do that. And say, okay, well, you take five minutes a day and you can read through his word in three years. Just get into his word. Maybe you can't do that. Maybe you need to do five, day, five days, five minutes a day, and that's all you need to do. And that, but you need a little bit of truth because you're been, being bombarded with a worldview that is not biblical. It is secular. We're being bombarded with that. You know, rarely a week or two goes by where someone isn't talking to me either in their church or in the community, someone I know, and they'll start talking about some sermon they heard from some pastor. And I have to bite my tongue really hard because it was so great he said this. And it's not biblical. It's not from a biblical worldview. And I'm thinking, you know, if you're in this more, you'd identify that as being wrong. And you could check that person. You could check me. I mean, I want to speak biblical truth, but how do you know if I'm speaking biblical truth? You know, because if you're looking at the, he gave you what you need. And so we need to make sure that we're familiar with his word to check people who are speaking and things that we hear and things we hear from the culture. So we have a biblical worldview. It's critically important that we do that, especially today. When we see truth, we need to recognize the truth for what it is, just like Nicodemus did. We want to be truth seekers, seeking Jesus. He's seeking Jesus. He's seeking truth. He's looking at the word. He's looking at him. He's saying, what you're doing could not be done if it weren't for God being with you. And he was able to identify the work of God. We need to make sure that we can identify the work of God as well. We can see it in general revelation. He's given us his word. We need to be familiar with it and handle it well because there is no excuse. I mean, if we're going to be really honest, the reason we don't know God's word as we should is because we're lazy. And we're being entertained to death in a consumer culture. I'm going to binge watch that TV program, Pastor. I didn't have time to open my Bible this week. I was too busy. And if I asked you, how much time did you watch that football games? Or how much time did you spend watching that program? You would have a hard time responding. And I understand that because I have the same problems that you do. <laughs> but we need to get into his word and know his word and be truth seekers. So that's the, the reason for the encounter for Nicodemus. He's going to Jesus to seek truth, which also leads to the result of the encounter. What is the result of this counter, encounter? Well, the result was understanding his need for spiritual birth. We see that in verses 3 to 15. As Jesus often does, he goes straight to Nicodemus' need and ours. He goes straight to the heart of, heart of the matter. We see that in verse 3. In John 3, verse 3, it says, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, or truly, truly I tell you, there's amen, amen is there. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And here he is speaking to a leader in Israel saying, You need to be born again. And whatever Nicodemus' planned interview questions might have been, Jesus skips formalities as he often does and addresses the need for Nicodemus and really for all of us. And Jesus begins with truth. Amen, amen. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, the author of truth, the one who is truth, starts by saying, truly, truly, I say to you, what is the truth that Nicodemus needs to know? What is Nicodemus's need? What's my need? What's your need? To be born again. To be born of the Spirit. In John 1, 12 to 13, John earlier had written, Yet to all who did receive him, Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children who are not of natural descent, nor of, a human, of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. Jesus saying, Nicodemus, your impressive credentials are garbage. They will not save you. Your good works are not good enough. And your diplomas mean nothing if you're not born again. Now, I, I have an ordination. Some of you would be surprised to know that actually I am ordained. Um, <laughs> the, the, the Free Church of America ordained me. And, and this was August 6th of the year 2000. It was a long process for me. And this, you had to be licensed first. It's like several year process. And, and I, whenever I get this out, I have to find it first. And I told Gene a couple weeks ago, hey, I'm going to need this for a message I'm doing right now. Do you know where that is? I haven't seen it forever. You know, and so she digs through and she finds it because I can't find anything. She'll probably say it was like right where you open a drawer every other day or something. But anyways, she found it. I don't have it up on my wall, and that's intentional. Now, it's nothing wrong with having it up on the wall. But what this represents to me is a bunch of guys got together, and they had me write a paper, and then they evaluated the paper. And then we got together and they grilled me, right? That's what we call the ordination process. And they asked me these questions and I had to respond to the questions and they thought I answered the questions good enough. So a bunch of guys got together and say, we think Rich is okay. And we're gonna give him this piece of paper because we, we think Rich is okay. And that's great. I'm glad they think I'm okay. But the picture I have up on my wall is very intentional. I don't really pay much attention to the ordination. This is just a picture. I don't like, usually like pictures of Jesus. I'm just going to say that. But this mean, means something to me. And there's a guy there. You might say he could be a pastor. And he's simply looking at Jesus and listening to Jesus and paying attention to Jesus in a relationship with Jesus. And there's, 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 there's a verse there. It says, Psalm 73, 24, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. And the reason I have this up on the wall is because when things get crazy and I get the phone calls I don't want to get or whatever it might be, the bad news is coming, I need to turn and go to Jesus. My ordination is going to help me a whole bunch in some of those situations. And something I've learned is that this doesn't mean anything if I don't have this. All right, so this, my ordination, really doesn't mean anything if my relationship with Jesus is not what it should be. And this is exactly what he's trying to get across to Nicodemus. It's like Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you're learning your status, your works, your reputation. It's not going to help you. You need to be born of God. And he's basically saying, so does everybody. Now, Nicodemus is a teacher of Israel, but he needs to be taught by the teacher of Israel. And this is personal. He needs to be born again. Here he is. He's a Pharisee. He's a teacher of Israel. You can only imagine the ego he would have had in the situation that he was in. And Jesus is saying, garbage. You need to humble yourself and you need to be born again. And that is the message that he has for Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, verse 4 to 5, it says, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. He does not get what you, right over him, does not get what he's saying. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born, which is just, of course, nonsense. You ladies would probably be terrified, right? <laughs> Jesus answered, thankfully he didn't say yes, that would mean to happen. Um, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you again, truly, truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. He's saying you have to be born again. Now Nicodemus did not understand the significance of spiritual birth, and Jesus said that he'd be born of water and the spirit. Now this is debated. The water here could be referring to the water of physical birth compared to spiritual birth. Have you, you've been born of water, right? You're like the, the water breaks, you go through the whole process. We're waiting for that to happen as a family. Almost any time now, we're, we're expecting to be, I'm expecting to be a grandparent. It could, could happen any day. Uh, and that's, that's what we're talking about. That's, that's physical birth. And some people say, what he's saying here is, okay, just like you're born of water, you need to be born of the spirit. And it could be. Another possibility, which I think because of the context of the passage is likely, is the water could be referring to water baptism as a sign of spiritual birth. And, and, and throughout the book of John, early on, chapter 1, 
2 and 3, this idea of baptism is very important. And it, it talks about it quite a bit. And it's, it's, it was a baptism of repentance. But the whole idea, idea is Jesus is coming. And that one, when he comes, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. That is spiritual birth. That is new life. And that is what you meet, need. In John chapter 1, verse 32 to 33, in the larger context, we have John the Baptist at Jesus' baptism. It says, then John, being John the Baptist, gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, okay, people are being baptized with water for repentance. Great, you need to repent. But what you really need is spiritual birth. What you really need is Jesus and what he provides. You need to be born again. Either way, water by itself is insignificant. The baptism must be accompanied by the cleansing, transforming, and regenerative work of the Holy Spirit. You are not born of a human work. You are born due to God's work. That we must be born again is Jesus' point. We must be born of God. In Titus chapter 3, verse 4 to 7, it says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, not our works, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. You need to be born again, is what he's saying. In verses 6 to 8, we see Jesus clarify the difference between natural birth and spiritual birth. In verse 6 to 8, he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Two different births. You should not be surprised by my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. So flesh gives birth to flesh. My bio biological father gave me physical life. Spirit gives birth to spirit. My heavenly father gives me spiritual life, eternal life, meaningful life, abundant life, true life. Now in verse 7 here, the you, um, for you must, be must you have to be born again here, is plural, okay? Um, it's, it's not just for Nicodemus. It's for everyone. We all have to be born of God. If you've not been born of God then you're spiritually dead. One night, Canon Hay Aitken preached to a large audience in Bristol, England, on the text, you must be born again. In the audience was a brilliant young man named Horatio Bottomley. He listened intently. He heard the preacher give an invitation, calling him to come forward to receive Christ. And he felt that push. He felt that urge. He believed it was truth. And he felt that conviction, but he did not go. He said, no, I will be in charge of my own life. He made a fortune and a name for himself as the champion of the people's rights. He was a lawyer. He exposed swindlers and prosecuted criminals with great energy and enthusiasm. When Bottomley was 63 years of age, this one who had exposed the crimes of others himself was convicted of a crime and sentenced to seven years in prison. While he was there, another man visited him and asked, asked if he could pray with him. Bottomly consented and said that would be fine. And in the course of the conversation, this other man told his story. He said, many years ago, I was in Bristol and I heard a preacher, Canon Hay Aitken, preach on the text, you must be born again. I was so deeply moved that I committed to my life to Christ. I have, and ever since then, Christ has been my all in all. Bottomly was silent for some time. And then he said, I too was there that night. I too heard that searching message. I too was deeply moved. I knew my need of Christ, but I rejected him. And then he said remorsefully, a life without God is a wasted life. Are you trying to live your life without God? Are you a holdout? Are you resisting complete surrender and wasting your time? Are you a follower of Jesus, but still too often trying to live your life on your own rather than submitting to the Lordship of Christ Jesus? Stop wasting your time and surrender. In verse 8 of our passage, the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. Like the Hebrew word ruah for spirit, it can mean spirit or wind. And Jesus' point in our passage is that although the wind is invisible and mysterious, we can still know the truth of wind as we experience the wind. There has been a lot of wind around here the last week. You guys notice that? How many of you noticed the wind? Right? You see everything blowing around. Yeah, it's been, it's been really, really windy. And that's Jesus' point, right? Where did it come from? You notice it, right? Even though you don't know where it came from. 
Well, likewise, the Holy Spirit is beyond our earthly knowledge, but can be known as we enter into relationship with God through faith in Christ, through being born of the Spirit, by being born again. In Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21 to 22, it says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set a seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. In Romans 8, 9, it says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. We can't, sometimes it's a mistake that I, that I believe happens out there. People think you can have Jesus but not have the Holy Spirit, or have the Father and not have Jesus. The Godhead cannot be divided like that. So if you have Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus. It's really clear. Scripture makes that clear. Romans 8, 9 makes that clear. You can't have one without the other. The question is, do you have Jesus? Do you have new life? Have you been born of the Spirit? It's an important question. Nicodemus needs to be born again, and we all need to be born again. If we haven't been born by trusting in the work of the cross, then it's something still needs to happen, then it needs to happen. In John 3, verse 9 to 13, Nicodemus still doesn't get it, right? He's having this conversation. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, again, truly, truly, amen, amen. I tell you, and he, you changes to the plural here, by the way, throughout the rest of the passage. Very truly, I tell you, as in you all, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. Well, Jesus is saying we here, and he's probably referring to him as disciples and people who are followers, people who have received him. But still you people, those who reject him, do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you, again in the plural, you, of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Now, I think as Nicodemus, as, as a scholar in Israel, when he hears the Son of Man, he understands it's a messianic title. He, it would have been very understandable if he, he, if he would have gotten that from Daniel chapter 7 would have been instructive to him. Now, there are 10 plural we's and you's in verses 11 to 12. These truths are not just for Nicodemus. To Nicodemus and all humanity, you are not saved by your good works. You are not saved by your status. You need a savior. You need new birth, and you will not enter the kingdom of heaven without new birth. If you think your works are good enough, they are not. Nicodemus was a teacher of Israel. He was even a sincere man. He had Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. He was a leader. He had a pedigree. And Jesus is saying, you, with all your works and credentials, will go to hell if you are not born again. He's making it very clear. You need to understand. You need to be born of the Spirit. And again, in verse 11, we see that double saying of amen, amen, truly, truly. This is truth straight from God. Jesus knows the truth. He knows our need, but unbelieving people re will reject his testimony. Those who believe are the we who speak of what we know. Are you speaking up about Jesus? Now, this is absolutely critical to me because we live in a day and an age where everyone's telling you to take Jesus and put him in your back pocket. Do not say his name. Do not bring him up. Do not tell people. Why do you think the enemy doesn't want us proclaiming the gospel of Jesus? Because he's terrified of the gospel of Jesus because he knows its power. And so we're told over and over and over again, do not bring Jesus up. We need to believe Jesus, what he says. He makes it very clear. Believe in Jesus, enter into a relationship with Jesus, that is to know him, and then testify about Jesus. Are you testifying about Jesus? Has the enemy silenced you? Now, the reason Jesus knows this truth is because he is from heaven. Only one person that ever come from heaven is his origin to earth. And that is Jesus because he is also God in the flesh. In John 1.18, it says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God. Who is he? Is it clear? Jesus is himself God. 
And is in closest relationship with the Father, which is interesting. He is God, but he's separate from the Father. There's a relationship with the Father has made him known. Because you look at Jesus, you're looking at God. You're looking at the character and nature of God himself. And God cared enough to send the very best. And in 1944, C.E. Goodman of Hallmark Greeting Cards wrote a slogan. When you care enough to send the very best. And ever since, that motto has been used to sell many greeting cards. But when we look at Jesus, it's not just some sort of motto that's trying to get you to buy something. It's a truth that has profound implications. God cared enough to send the very best. Now, this makes God like no other gods. This is not a religion, right? He's not gonna, it's not like, hey, I read my word, so I'm doing a check mark. I prayed, so I'm doing a check mark. I did this, so I'm doing a check mark. I, I did whatever service I said over here, so I did a check mark, so I'm good enough, right? Well, religion is now what we're talking about. Religion comes from Latin, means to tie back to God, to be good enough to be in his presence. And that is not what we're talking about, and that's not what Jesus gives us. He does not give us a religion. He gives us a relationship. And that's why he came to earth as a person, died in our place, and now sends the Holy Spirit to indwell us. He wants a relationship. And the need of all people, your need is new birth, spiritual birth. This is what the word says. This is what the truth is. The question is, will we receive it? In John 3, verse 14 to 15, it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, Jesus illustrates the need to place our faith in, in Christ by alluding to Numbers 21, 4 to 9 that Jan read from earlier. As the snake was lifted up, so all who looked at God's provision were physically healed. So Jesus was lifted up on the cross that all who trust in God's provision at the cross will be healed spiritually. They will be born again. They'll put their faith in that which is going to save them. In John 17, verse 3, it says, Now this is eternal life. Well, that'd be important to know. That they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This eternal life is gained now for all who trust in Jesus. And if you trust in Jesus, you are born anew today. And today, you can be born again. And then there should be a change. There should be a difference in your life in some way. If I had a car needing a new engine, let's say I like the outside of the car, but the engine just shot. It's not running well at all. They so say you need a new engine. So I take it in and have a new one installed. If I got it back and it still ran just as poorly, I'd probably question whether or not they put in the new engine, right? Have you been born again? Do you know? Has there been a change? 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. They are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Has the new come? 1 John 5, 11 to 13 says, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I don't know how to make it any more simple than that. <laughs> really simple. And he said, I write these things to you believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know that you have eternal life. You can know that you've been born again by trusting in Jesus and entering a relationship with him based on his work on the cross. And he says it as simple as he can over and over and over again, yet people argue with him. We need to know Jesus and know spiritual life. So there you're here, you're online, that's one of the questions I have is, are you a holdout? Have you put your faith in Jesus? Have you personally invited him to take hold of your life? That is salvation. That is eternal life. If you don't have that, you're in a bad position spiritually for an eternity. This is a great need. Jesus told Nicodemus, you need to be born again. This guy was a leader in Israel. He had all sorts of probably good works and credentials. How do you think we're going to stack up? We need to be born again. We need a Savior. We need Jesus. Now, for those of us who are believers and where we put our faith in Jesus, this means we should grow in him. There should be changes. We should desire to be like him. We still need him. It's not like we've come to salvation. I don't need you anymore. <laughs> I come to salvation. I need to be know you every day, better and better and better. I need this, not this. We need to make sure that relationship with Jesus is growing, and we need to make sure we're telling people about Jesus. You know what's going to happen if you tell people about Jesus, if we, if we become more bold? They're going to make fun of you. Some people will. 
Some people will respond. Some people will make fun of you. Some people call you a name. Some people call you racist or bigot, laugh at you in some way or another, right? Well, hey, so what? They're going to make fun of you anyway. There's lots of reasons to make fun of you. There's lots of. There's lots of reasons to make fun of me. There's a whole lit- Why don't we make the reason they make fun of us be something worthwhile being made fun of? The enemy does not want us to speak, and the church is way, oh boy, we've been silent way too long. We need to make sure we become very bold in the days ahead. Let's pray for that. Let's make sure we're praying for the lost. There's people who don't know Jesus. What is going to happen to them if they die in that state? That should be very motivating for us. And we can begin by praying for them on a daily basis, and I hope that you do. But if you're watching online, you're here, and you've yet to receive Christ yourself, my prayer is that you receive him, that you know him, you receive his work on the cross, you enter into a saving relationship, you have eternal life, you're born again. If you haven't personally invited Christ, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do so in a second. It's so important because God created you to be in a relationship with him. That's what he wants, and it's what you need. It's what you were created for. And our sin separates us from a holy God who has nothing to do with sin. It's an abomination to him. He hates it. And sin is not going to be removed by human effort. There's nothing you can do. Hey, Nicodemus wasn't good enough. You're not good enough. I'm not good enough. Nobody is good enough. We need a perfect sacrifice. We need a perfect representative who in our place did what we cannot, and that is who Jesus is. And paying the price for our sin, he died on the cross and he rose again. That Everyone puts their faith and their trust in his work on the cross as eternal life. Life that begins now and lasts forever. And I plead with you. That's one of my prayers. I, I, my regular prayers is that every one of those kids downstairs, everybody comes to these doors on a regular basis. People who watch online on a regular basis. I want to see you all in heaven. I want us all to be there. You need to be born again. If you're a holdout, if for some reason you're not, you, you, you haven't received Christ, I, I really encourage you and beg you to do so. But it doesn't mean a whole lot what I think. Is, is, is Jesus prompting you with the truth and saying, you need to come to me. You need to be born again. You need me. You need a savior. And if you hear him saying that, I'm going to pray. And, and prayer is just, it's just, you can do it on your own, right? It's just one way to communicate, I'm receiving you. I'm receiving your work on the cross. I want a relationship with you. I want you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And I want, I want you. I, I'm trusting in you and you alone because I need a savior. But I'm going to pray, and if God prompts you, I encourage you to pray that along with me in your heart right now. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place on the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood, your precious blood, in my place on the cross. I receive your work for me. I know I am a sinner. I know I have fallen short of your standard and I need a savior. I receive you as my savior and I receive your work on my behalf. And I trust you that today I am your child that always will be. And I ask that you would take my life and help other people to see the truth of who you are through me. And this I pray in your name, the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.